Good afternoon. It is Wednesday, December 1st, 2010, and I'm in the home of Richard Dixon, uh, who's, who I'm honored to be interviewing today. My name is Jim Mayola, and we're going to talk about Mr. Dixon's life and times. So, Richard, when were you born? Well, I was born in April, on April 17th, 1938. And you were born in Carroll County. Born in Westminster, Maryland, Carroll County. Did you live? Did your family live in Westminster at the time? We lived in Westminster at the time. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, do you remember the address? No, I, I remember we lived on. Uh, we lived off of Union Street. Okay. Yeah. And I understand the name of the street was was Tin Tin Cup Alley. But I don't remember the exact, the correct name. Yeah, that, that's what I remember. That's what I recall. Why did they call it Tin Cup Alley? That's interesting. I, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I have no idea. We lived there for a number of years. Then we then we moved to 30, 36 Charles Street okay. on, in another part of Westminster. So you grew up in the town. Yes. And came of age in the town in the late thirties, early forties. You were a young young man. What was it like? What was Westminster like in the late 30s, early 40s? Well, Westminster was, of course, a segregated town back in those days. Mm -hmm. I went to Robert Moton School, which was a segregated, segregated school. Mm -hmm. All black children, all, all my life, but I went there from 1944 until 1950. I was in the 7th uh, grade when we went, went to a new high school. It was built in the county for black kids. Mm -hmm called Robert Moton School, and then I went, went there until I graduated in 1956. Mm -hmm. It was a good school, had very caring teachers, and uh, I did very well in school. Mm -hmm. I, I graduated first in my class. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, Mr. Dixon, uh, they passed the, uh, let's see, the law was passed in 1954, wasn't it, to, to desegregate, and it took us a couple of years to uh, to get around to it, apparently. So you were not, you were in a completely segregated school through your whole grade school and high school. Yes. Um, do you recall whether Westminster had any growing pains when we got into desegregation? No, I don't recall. Yeah. Because I know there were not any growing pains at the time I was in school, which was uh, 54, I was, in the, I was in the 10th grade, and I mm -hmm. graduated in 56. Right. There, there, I know we had a, several boys in my school went to the New Windsor School, mm -hmm. which, is a, which was a white school at, at the time. Right. But, uh, but, but most of the kids stayed in my, at Robert Moton School. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about what it was like when you were a young boy living in downtown Westminster. What kinds of things did you do? What kind of games did you play? Well, we played a lot of baseball, softball, softball mm -hmm. football. Uh -huh. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't play on the playground because the playground was off limits to us and for white kids only. Yeah. I went to the movies a lot. My father was a projectionist at the theater, so I, I, I went to the movies free. <laughs> that was a bargain. So uh, not only was it a bargain, it was a status symbol because yeah, sure. that was before television. Yeah. So move, going to the movies was a big big thing. So I went to the movies free every time the, movie, every time the picture changed. Wow. That was pretty cool. Now your dad was Thomas. Thomas Dixon, yes. yes. And um, I've heard from a lot of people in the community that um, he was well respected. Uh, Ron Brewer told me that he taught, that your dad taught him how to run the projection equipment and taught him everything he knew about the theater. So, uh, and I understand he worked at the library. Yes. Yeah. He was custodian at the library? He was custodian at the library, yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what kind of movies did you see at the movie theater? Oh, I don't recall now. It's been so long ago. Yeah. You talk. You talk about the 1950s and early 60s. Right. I'm 72 years of age mm -hmm. now. That, that's that's over 50 years ago. Yes, indeed. What was downtown Westminster like when you were a youngster? Downtown Westminster was a thriving business community. Uh, Main Street was uh, all where all the activity took place. On a, on a, on a Friday or Saturday night, the street was. Uh, uh, booming with activity, business business activity. Mm -hmm. and everyone did the shopping there. All the grocery stores were on uh, were on Main Street, mm -hmm. so it was the center of activity for the for the community. I understand that that Westminster was not only a college town because we had Western uh, Maryland College in town, but we had Western Maryland Railway 
that came through there. So this was also a, kind of a railroad town with a lot of railroad activity. Do you recall any of that when you were a youngster? I recall getting my newspaper from the, from the train when, when the train came through because I, I worked for the Washington Star for a while, so they brought the papers up on the train. Mm -hmm. I got them off the train and delivered newspapers around town. But 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 the train was the main act, main activity because it it was the tra main transportation between Westminster and Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And then of course it went on to the New Windsor and Union Bridge and all further west. Right. But the Western Maryland was a was a thriving railroad back during those days. Mm -hmm. So people actually commuted from Westminster to Baltimore to work. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. So regular customer uh, routes along with all the um, freight that they carried on the station. It was known as the fast, fast freight line. So they did a, their, their main business was freight, but the passenger business was, was a, a, an ancillary business. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dixon, you said you delivered papers. Uh, how old were you? I don't recall. <laughs> I, I was probably a teenager. Yeah. I delivered papers for the Washington Star. I had an interesting paper route because I delivered papers all over town. Uh -huh. I delivered papers up as far as Fed Village, up on the eastern part of town, up past the college, and I delivered papers on Fairground Hill on the, on the west, east part of town. In the western part of town I, uh, was, was Fed Village, mm -hmm. uh, and I delivered them on a bicycle, and I had a, I had a, I had a huge paper, paper route. Yeah. Most most boys who delivered papers had a right, right in the neighborhood. Sure. But I delivered papers all over town, and the paper was so big on Sundays my father took me around in his car. <laughs> but it was a big paper route, and I had an interesting time because the man who was in between me and the paper, uh, my wholesaler, if you will, mm -hmm. got in some trouble. So I started dealing directly with the Washington Star paper. Right. And they started paying me bonuses for selling extra papers on Sunday. And when I brought in new customers, I got a bonus. It was a really a thriving business activity for me. Wow, that's interesting. I bet you could tell some stories about that. Because you have the responsibility, like a mailman, you have to deliver papers whether it's raining or snowing or what. I, I deliver papers five days, six, seven days a week. Yeah, wow. Rain or shine, yeah. snow or snow or blow. And you got to meet a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Now, did you also collect the money? I collected the money. Yeah, that must have been a challenge sometimes. No, pe people were very good. They, good. they, they paid on time. Good. I had no problem collecting money. So um, that was your first real job then? You were basically an entrepreneur as a, as a teenager. Well, that wasn't my first real job. I, I worked for a lady named Margaret Stoner, an Isaac Stoner. I worked, uh, I mowed their grass and helped out in the yard. Mm -hmm. They did their gardening. I, I was doing that when I was probably about nine or ten years of age. Wow! So I had, I've had a job for most of my life, mm -hmm. but that was probably the first job I had uh, where I was doing, I was really, where I was really getting paid some real money with the Washington Star newspapers. Sure. And they saw the uh, they they appreciated the, your work ethic and saw the value of what you were doing because you were helping to grow the paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. What did you do um, after high school? After high school, I went to college. Okay, talk, could you talk about that a little bit? I went to Morgan State University. Right. At the time, it was Morgan State College. Right. I had a full scholarship to go to Morgan because I was number one student in my class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started out being a math major, but math didn't seem to agree with me, so I changed my major in my in my, in my uh, second year to uh, business administration. Mm -hmm. But uh, I lost my scholarship in my in my, se in my second year because my grades had weren't weren't good enough. Right. But uh, so I got a, I got a loan that, that I paid myself. I paid back myself mm -hmm. after I graduated to pay for my last two years of college. Mm -hmm. But Morgan was a great experience for me because I uh, I met many friends and uh, had a good relationship with most of my professors there. Mm -hmm. Um, after uh, so so you saw the value of an education even though you had lost your scholarship you decided you had to continue you had to keep going oh yeah yeah you know, yeah it was quite an investment and uh, I have suspect it's paid off now didn't you go back to Morgan for your master's degree uh, from, from, from a master's degree but also while I was at Morgan I was in ROTC mm -hmm. and when I graduated from Morgan I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army okay so uh, uh, now, when did you go into Mo into Morgan? When did you start? 1956. Okay, and so you came out in 1960. 1960. So that was when we were getting into Vietnam, wasn't it? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your military experiences a little bit? Well, I spent eight years in the U.S. Army, and uh, I rose to the rank of captain. I spent some time with the Third Armored Cavalry Regiment in Germany. I spent a, a year and a half, a year with, with the 101st Airborne Division in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I was a medical administrative officer most of that career, and uh, I, that's what I did in, in, in most of my assignments. I, I, my, my last assignment was in Vietnam with the uh, the 67th Vac Hospital, where I was the uh, registrar for the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then I was registered for Kimber Army Hospital back in Fort Meade when I came back home. Mm -hmm. But my Army career was uh, was it was a good career, and I enjoyed it a lot. But I, but after Vietnam, I decided that I, I could do a better job for myself on the outside. Mm -hmm. Vietnam was not a pleasant experience for me. Cause it was the wrong war at the wrong time. Vietnam was not a pleasant experience for many people. Yeah, it was, those were some tough times for our country. Um, after Vietnam, you came, you came back. You're you're back. Well, your 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 last assignment was at Fort Meade, so you're back in the in the neighborhood again. Back in the neighborhood. Yeah. And so, what happened with Mr. Dixon? And what what did Richard Dixon do after he got out of the out of the army? I went to work for Providence Hospital Comprehensive Neighborhood Health Center. Mm -hmm. I was an executive director for the health center for the Providence. And I stayed there about a year. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and I, I left there to take a job with Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Finner, and Smith. And the job with Merrill Lynch was really exciting job because I, I was I worked for, really I worked for myself. I, I was basically self-employed because I worked on I worked on commissions. Mm -hmm. and I stayed there for 27 years, wow. so I enjoyed it yeah. immensely. I bet. How did you get involved with um, with with uh, politics? I, I, I read your bio. There's a, a wonderful write-up about you in the on the internet through the uh, Maryland Legislature, and it gives your history, and um, you, you were involved in so many committees and commissions and organizations. How did you get involved with that? It's, it sounds like you were always, always wanted to be active in your community. Well, I was on the school board in Crook mm -hmm. County from 70 to 78, mm -hmm. and uh, serving on the school board gave me a lot of visibility in, in the community. Mm -hmm. A guy by the name of Charles Smelser, who was a senator at the time, suggested I run for public office. I told him I, I didn't think I could run for public office in Carroll County because I didn't believe I could be elected, mm -hmm. knowing the county was 97% white. Right. Uh, and he told me he thought I could get elected and he would help me. Okay. So that's how I got started in politics. I, I tried and I ran in 78 for the House of Delegates mm -hmm. and I lost, mm -hmm. which I hate to talk about. <laughs> but it was a very enriching experience losing because I ran against two other guys who were pretty pretty good fellows. Mm -hmm. I ran again in 82 after we had, had redistricting redistr and there was an empty seat or a vacant seat, I should say, and right. uh, I won one of the seats. Mm -hmm. I was in 82 and then I won, I won four more times. I was in office for 13 years in the House of Delegates, wow. which is a long time to be in the House of Delegates. Yes, indeed. And I was on in leadership. I was I chaired the Joint Committee on Pensions, and I chaired the Joint Budget and Audit Committee. Mm -hmm. And I served on the uh, Appropriations Committee for all about 13 years, which was a powerful committee to be on. Mm -hmm. I bet you have some, some stories that you could tell about being in the legislature. Now, now, were you a Democratic affiliation or a Republican? I was a Democrat. You're a Democrat. You're a, an African American Democrat that was elected from Carroll County, which is 97 percent white and probably 95 percent Republican. It's, it's that's, <laughs> that's astonishing. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And reelected yes. time and time again. Yes, that is that is astonishing. And well, it just goes to show that people can respect a person for who they are, regardless of what party they're affiliated with, which I wish more people would do today. Well, I was the lone Democrat elected in this county. for When I got elected in 82 for the first time, I was the first Democrat elected to the House in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when I, when, I, when I left office to become treasurer of the state of Maryland, I was the last Democrat elected in, in, to office in Carroll County. Wow. That's amazing. 
Now talk about the Treasury a little bit. You were the State Treasurer. State Treasurer for six years and uh, elected by the General Assembly to be State Treasurer. And the House and the Senate in joint session vote for you to be Treasurer. Right. And it was interesting for me because I uh, had to <coughs> talk to, to my colleagues in the House and the Senate to get them to vote for me. Mm -hmm. and, and the election was not close. I won by, uh, oh, I think about 135 votes I had, and I had my opponent had about 50 votes. Mm -hmm. So it was not a close election, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I was the first African American elected treasurer of the state, mm -hmm. and also the first delegate from from West from, from Western Maryland elected treasurer of the state. Mm -hmm. So I got elected w the first time in, in 96 then I got reelected, re and in, in, uh, three years later, I got reelected to be treasurer. I was elected two times to be treasurer. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible uh, uh, responsibility. I mean, what kinds of what kinds of things did you have to do as treasurer? What were some of your responsibilities? Well, I handled all the state's money. Mm -hmm. Most people leave the, the comptroller handles the money. The comptroller is the tax collector. Right. So the comptroller collects taxes and turns all the money over to the treasurer. And I deal with all the banks in the state. I dealt with all the banks in the state mm -hmm. uh, that, that that had a, a relationship with with the treasurer's office. Mm -hmm. So I dealt with all the banks. I, I, I signed all the contracts between the state, state of Maryland and, and, and uh, financial institutions, mm -hmm. and, and generally managed all the state's money, which which was ran ran generally about about five billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge amount of money that was under my my, my uh, authority and control. Right, a tremendous responsibility. And and you were reelected for that position, so yes. obviously you were well respected by your peers, and you did a good job. That's remarkable. And I understand that you um, that that there were some challenges in Carroll County while you were in the House of Representatives and while you were the treasurer, and you always looked out after Carroll County during your your time there. Can you talk about some of those accomplishments? Well, I, I looked out for Carroll County all the time. Sure. And uh, I was able to get money for the YMTA is out on Washington Road, mm -hmm. half a million dollars. There was, there was money for Western Maryland College I, I, I obtained for them alone. So I built, they built a new uh, library, mm -hmm. uh, Hoover Library, with, with, with two million dollar loan I received for for, for Carroll County. Right. There are many other projects that I, I was involved in. Getting the modernization for for Francis Scott Key High School, mm -hmm. the the uh, new middle school was built on Oklahoma Road, o o Oklahoma Road in Sykesville. I was the key key individual in getting the money for that for that facility, mm -hmm. and the list the list goes on and on. Yeah, it sounds like you were a very active person, but you didn't slate the rest of the state. You just looked out for Carroll County, so you were responsible for a lot of things that were going on. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Dixon, what what was the most exciting time during your your uh, uh, work with the legislature? My most exciting time was when I served in, in the legislature and uh, as delegate, mm -hmm. because I was able to work with many people down there, and uh, I was able to get some bills killed on the floor of the house, which happens very rarely, because normally when bills come to the floor, they pass automatically. Mm -hmm. But I was. Uh, well, I was considered a very uh, bright legislator, if I have to say so myself, because when I first was elected, there were 50 new delegates in the, in the House of Delegates that year, mm -hmm. and the news posted a poll as to who, was, who were the outstanding delegates among the 50, and I was selected, selected as one of the top five delegates out of that class of 50. Wow. So I, I, uh, I was very active in, 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 in speaking on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I took an active role on working on bills mm -hmm. that that I that I supported and bills that I didn't support. Mm -hmm. So so my name was uh, was was the name the people when the people heard me speak, they knew I was serious and uh, and, and they, they listened to me. Right. They didn't ignore me like like a lot of times when people speak on the floor, no one listens to you. Right. So you were actually able to kill some bills when you realized they were bad legislation. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. That's very amazing. Yeah. What kind of changes have you seen in the county, Mr. Dixon? I mean, you've you've come up for, I mean, we're talking 
70 years here of experience in Carroll County, what are the most profound changes that, you, that you've seen happen? Well, I, I believe the integration of schools is a profound change because I went to a school my first s s six years that was, that was not only segregated, but was also we had, we had no indoor plumbing. We, wow. had, we had outhouses for the school. No kidding. No kidding. Wow. And uh, we, they built a new school for us in 19, 1950, which did have a indoor plumbing. Had, it had a showers for boys and showers mm -hmm. for girls. Mm -hmm. And we had an aud auditorium, which, which was brand new. Mm -hmm. So that was a big change. And then, mm. of course, when they integrated the schools, that, that was a big, big change. And uh, I would say that the integration was a significant change for the county. But, but I think the most significant change was the fact that I could run for office in this county and get elected and get reelected. Mm -hmm. I chose that people would vote for you if you if they believe you can do the job. If they believe you can do the job and vote for you. Yep. That says something about this community, doesn't it? Yes. You know, the people here um, judge you on your merits and on your ethics versus um, you know what what party you're affiliated with or what your background is. That's that's important. Um, any other stories that you can think of that you'd like to share with us today? There are so many stories I could tell, I but, know. I, but I would rather keep them keep them. Uh, something keep something that you'd like to share from your childhood or young adulthood or something that that. That's an example of what Carroll County was like when you were when you were growing up, or you know anything. I can't think of any right at the present time. Okay. Let me ask you this, Mr. Dixon: um, If you were going to give some advice to somebody that was getting ready to start off today, um, you know it's a different world than it was in the '40s and the '50s. Um, you know, a youngster could go out on, their, on his own with a, with a high school or a college education and get a job and make enough money to afford pretty much to get by. Um, if you were going to offer some advice to a young person today that was getting ready to graduate, well, was graduating from high school or college and getting ready to start a career or a family, what advice would you give them? Well, the advice I would give, and I should have mentioned this, I think we have one of the best school systems in the, in the, state, of, in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an opportunity for young people to get an education, and not only for college preparation, but also career-wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had a plumber come out to my house uh, yesterday, and I had a dripping faucet, mm -hmm. and it cost two hundred thousand to get the faucet repaired. Mm -hmm. And you can come out of Westminster High School today with with, with uh, a background in plumbing work. And immediately get a job as a plumber. Yep. There's, 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 there's the, the availability of courses in the, in our high schools is unbelievable. That's correct. And so I would say to any young person today, take your schooling very seriously. Mm -hmm. Get the best grades you can get, right. and then do the same when you're going to college. And it's because mm -hmm. when you go to college, when you when you make and you when you first go to college, you make an impression that stays with you throughout throughout the throughout your years in school. Mm -hmm. So if you do well your first year, you do, do well all your years in college. Mm -hmm. So it's important to do well. You get the reputation that you're a good student. And it's a good, you had that same reputation in, in high school, to do well, because you, you only go, go through high school one time. And when you have a good school system like we have here in the county, it's best to take advantage of it. Absolutely. My son, who went to Morehouse College, uh, Took four years of German at Westminster High School, mm -hmm. and when he went to Morehouse, they told him he could take second year German, college German. I, I told him to take first year college German. He, he'd probably get an A. Well, he took second year college German, and got an A. Good for him. So mm -hmm. this shows to show the pre preparation that he had in, in high school and how well he was prepared to go to college. Mm -hmm. It made a difference. So, our, our school system is, 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 as I said, one of the best, and it's, it's something that every young person should take advantage of, because mm -hmm. the, the, the preparation is there for you for a career, whether you, that's as far as you want to go, or if you want to go on to higher education. Mm -hmm. But do well, and, and, and take, just take all your schoolwork very seriously. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Mr. Uh, Dixon. 
Uh, we talked a little bit uh, at the beginning of the interview about your father and, and what he did in the community and how well respected he was. Um, what kind of an impression did he make on you as a young person? Well, he made a big impression because he, he had a job, for example, that very few black men had, and in, in, well, no other black men had a job like my father had in this county. At the time, he was a projectionist, and uh, there were very few black projectionists there anywhere in the state. Mm -hmm. And he was self-taught. Hmm. He, uh, he, he worked as a, as a custodian at, at the theater, but he watched the man who ran the projectors, and one day they, they had a breakdown, and, and my father told the boss he knew how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And he did, and then he got the job as being projectionist. Wow. So he had, a, he had a very important job for a black man back in the, I want to say in the 40s, in the, in the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he worked very hard at that job. He worked, he, worked, he worked six days a week. He was off on Mondays. Right. And he worked long hours because he's always, he worked always every day of the week. And he worked on Saturdays and Sundays from 1 o'clock when he ran the matinees mm -hmm. to 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So he worked very hard to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. And so he taught you um, the importance of being reliable and... Um, and a strong work ethic. Yes. Mm -hmm. What did your mom do? My mom took took in took took in washing. Mm -hmm. And how many uh, brothers and sisters did you have? I had two brothers and three sisters. Okay. And so pretty pretty good sized family. Yep. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we uh, had talked a little while ago about your um, going to Morgan. And, but we didn't talk about the fact that you pledged a uh, fraternity in, in Morgan. You pledged Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I didn't pledge Kappa Alpha Psi at Morgan because I didn't have any money to pledge fraternity at Morgan <laughs> as a graduate student. I mean, I, 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 I pledged Kappa as a, as a graduate chapter. Mm -hmm. in, and I pledged a chapter in Frederick, Maryland. Okay. That's how I got in. Plus, I didn't like the way they treated people in, at Morgan campus. Were, were, were kind of brutal. Yes, they were. So you actually pledged at uh, in Frederick. Yes. Okay, but you stayed active. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm active. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what a, can you remember? Any other college experiences? Any other things that kind of stand out during your college experiences? Now you were talking the '50s here in yeah. a predominantly black college in Baltimore, Maryland. Well, I, I, I was, my, in my senior year, I, I was commander of the Purging Rifle Drill Team, mm -hmm. which was a high state and drill team at Morgan, Morgan State College back in those days. And uh, I was very proud to have been selected as, as, as the commander for the drill team. I've actually seen that group drill, and they are absolutely remarkable. They're amazing to, uh, to see them go through their routines. Um, that's uh, quite an accomplishment and um, quite an achievement. Mr. Dixon, um, how would you want people to remember you? I served the people. Mm -hmm. That's what I did on all my jobs. I served the people. Mm 